Welcome back to Adventures in Randomia, my solo Dungeons & Dragons adventure series. This is episode 15, in which our party gets involved in a bit of intrigue between two factions operating the city of Everpool. I hope you enjoy it, and please do let me know in the comments. Also, if you're enjoying the series and would like to download the graphics, then please consider supporting me on Patreon using the link in the description below. Last time, Freya, Clarissa and Connor were caught up in a mutiny on board the Frosty Maiden, led by the Boson Turek. They engaged in battle to defend the ship from the pirate Captain Maleg and his crew, who were trying to commandeer it. Clarissa's channel divinity attack easily overcame the pirates, who quickly retreated. However, Clarissa was left in shock with the power of her attack, leaving half the pirate crew dead and the rest badly wounded. We rejoin our adventurers on the next morning as the Frosty Maiden makes its final approach into the port of Everpool. Freya awakes to see Clarissa sitting in her bunk, whispering quietly as she stares intently at the cat's paw symbol made out of silver which hangs on a chain around her neck. Please help me. Talk to me. Help me to understand. Hey, Clarissa, what's up? says Freya. Oh, I'm trying to speak to my deity. I want to know whether I did the right thing yesterday. Oh, right. And what do they say? Well, this is it. They don't. I'm not receiving any kind of message, and I'm getting more and more worried about it. What if the priests at the temple were right? What if this is a blasphemous symbol like they said? What if I'm losing connection with a monitor? Well, you're clearly connected with something powerful. That radiant light attack was amazing, says Freya, smiling. But Clarissa is frowning. Yes, and that's the thing. What is it that I'm connected to? Can I trust it? Not sure I can help. I don't know much about deities. Where did that necklace come from anyway? Oh, it was around my neck when I was left at the temple as a kitten. Well, that's great, says Freya. That means your mother gave it to you. I suppose, says Clarissa doubtfully. But I don't actually know where it came from or what it means. I don't know, says Freya. Maybe we could find a temple or some sort of religious place in Everpool where you could get some guidance. They head up on deck and see the ship is already underway. Captain Baldrick greets them. He thanks them again for their help the previous day and explains that the journey into Everpool could be a bit slower with the loss of sail. We're working hard to fix the bowsprit, but the aft mast will have to wait until we're in part. The remainder of the voyage is uneventful, and by early afternoon, the Frosty Maiden is gliding into the dock of Everpool. This is a thriving port on the northern coast of Randomia, and is the largest city in the region. It has a somewhat forbidding look, with terraces of tall, imposing buildings built from grey stone with dark slate roofs designed to withstand the northern weather. The trio make their goodbyes to Baldrick and the crew. And Kana, if you're wanting to travel further west to Danimara, don't forget to look us up, says Baldrick. The harbour master can let you know our sailing schedule. Then they see the four mutinous crew being dragged out of the fore cabin, still tied up. What will you do with them? asks Clarissa. Well, we'll hand them over to the harbour authorities. La and Arda is pretty strict in Everpool, and they treat pirates very harshly. Connor asks, so the town's well guarded then? So we're going to roll some dice to find out what kind of government there is in Everpool. We get the keywords of duty, prize, fugitive, and NPC. So then we roll on the NPC tables and we get a lawful, evil, single-minded, well-off, human female. Oh yes, replies Baldrick. The whole region is in the refined but steely grip of Lady Seraphina Blackmore. Has been for the past ten years. You want to keep yourself on the right side of the law in this place, if you know what I mean. And he gives Connor a wink. Captain Baldrick also recommends an inn to stay at, the Everfleet, which is run by a distant cousin of his. The party leaves the dock and heads up the main street of the Merry Mile, which runs up an incline away from the dock. Despite the name of the street, the architecture gives the place a sombre formal feel. A short way up on the right, they find the inn. The sign outside depicts a naval ship at sea with a bright sun shining behind it. They step through the archway, flanked by grey stone columns, and enter a spacious common room with a rich dark wood interior. The simple solid furnishings within the common room are crafted from the same dark wood, sturdy tables and chairs thoughtfully arranged creating intimate nooks and open seating areas. The walls of the Everfleet are adorned with a fascinating collection of ship memorabilia such as iron anchors, ship's wheels and aged nautical maps. 
They head over to the bar counter and are greeted by the innkeeper, a cheerful looking human woman in her 40s with dark hair tied up in a neat bun. Hello, are you Yvonne Gallagher? asks Freya. Oi, that's me, who's asking? she replies. They are somewhat surprised this woman could be a cousin to Captain Baldrick, as she doesn't have half-elven features and appears to be a good ten years older than him. We're travellers, just arrived from Ice Hollow, explains Freya. The ship's captain, your cousin Jonah Baldrick, recommended your inn as a good place to stay. Oh, that scallywag Jonah, I always be up to something. Well, any friend of his is a friend of mine. Welcome, welcome. As she speaks, they then hear the resemblance in the accent. They book into two guest rooms and head upstairs for a quick freshen up and to drop off their belongings. After a bite to eat, they decide to do some shopping. Both Connor and Clarissa want to visit a bookshop, and Freya wants to find somewhere to sell the items that she looted from the ruined castle. They explain to Yvonne what they're looking for and ask her advice as to where to go. So we roll the dice and we find out that there is a books and map shop of medium quality, and there's an art, jewellery and gem trader of poor quality. Yvonne replies, Ah yes, well if you're looking for books and maps, then look no further than the Dusty Quill. It has the best selection of books, although it's not the best kept shop in town. As for selling art objects, well the only place I can think of is Silver Dukes. You may not get a great price though. It's basically a pawnbroker where the locals take their valuables to exchange for some quick gold. They follow Yvonne's instructions and climb the winding hill of Winburn Street and are soon standing outside the bookshop The Dusty Quill. This is a tall, narrow building with a bow-fronted window of small, rather grubby panes of glass. They enter the shop and a bell over the door jangles brightly as they pass through. The shop is packed from floor to ceiling with bookshelves and lives up to its name, being rather musty and not recently dusted. Clarissa sneezes. At this noise, the shop's owner emerges through a maroon velvet curtain which screens the rear of the shop. He is a portly, balding man in his fifties, wearing half-moon spectacles. He looks somewhat flustered. Ah, customers. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Dusty Quill. What can I do for you? But before they can answer, they are followed into the shop by an older half-elf with silvery long hair and a rather eccentric look. Afternoon, Ned. Usual place, yes? Yes, yes, of course, he replies quickly, down the stairs at the back, and the half-elf disappears behind the maroon curtain into the back of the shop. Connor asks for a book on the region of Donamara. The shop owner pulls out a slim brochure that looks like a tourist guide, as well as a thick tome on the history and people of Donamara. Hmm, maybe I'll take both, says Connor. He pays for them and starts flipping through the pages. Teresa then asks for a book on the tabaxi of southern Randomia. Not a common request, replies the shop owner, but I may have something up here. He pulls along the stepladder and climbs precariously up to search a high shelf. At that moment, the shop door opens and the bell rings loudly again. Two people enter, a skinny young man with lank greasy hair and round spectacles, and a young female halfling with short cropped red hair. Hi Ned, she calls out. Are we okay to go down? Yes, yes of course, he says, rather flustered again, and nearly falls off the ladder as he waves a hand towards the back of the shop. He turns his attention back to the shelf, muttering, no, I'm sure I had something here. The doorbell then jingles again, as an older human woman with a scholarly look arrives. Is this the right place for the Quillian's meeting? she asks. Yes, yes, he stammers, glancing at the adventurers. That's out the back. And again he waves her downstairs. The shopkeeper finally descends the ladder, holding three books, which he starts to show to Clarissa. The Quillian's? What's that? asks Connor idly. Oh, oh, well, it's nothing really. Just a little book club that I run here. He seems very flustered again. Connor rolls a 12 for insight. He's sure that the shopkeeper is hiding something. His manner seems very suspicious. Keep him busy, he whispers to Freya. Just as Clarissa is concluding her book purchase, Freya points out a large basket by the door filled with maps rolled into tubes. Oh, look, Clarissa, maps. You love maps, don't you? Can we have a look at these? She says to the shopkeeper. She goes over and starts pulling out the scrolls. The shopkeeper bustles over to supervise. As he's distracted, Connor creeps towards the back of the shop and slips behind the maroon curtain. We roll a stealth of 24 for him. The shopkeeper fails to see this, and Connor creeps down the stairs. He lurks at the doorway of what appears to be a reading room below, where a group of people are deep in discussion. But it doesn't sound like they are talking about a book. So here we have found our first faction in the city of Everpool. So we roll d20 and get a 2. So we discover this is a vigilante group. And then we get the keywords revealing, manage, admission and tale.
These are the Quillians, a group of investigators and writers committed to revealing the corruption in those that manage the city of Everpool. The old woman is saying, I've heard from my sources that there's another shipment coming in around midnight tonight. We must be there to investigate. This could be our chance to get the information we need to reveal who's behind this. The redhead halfling replies, Well, me and Wilfred can go check it out. Oh yes, says the young man suddenly animated. If this can help stop the corruption in the city, then absolutely I am in. The half-elf then speaks. So that is settled then. Ginny and Wilfred will stake out Grimes' cave and bring back any information that they find. But on no account do you show yourselves. You must keep hidden and stay safe. The two younger members of the group nod. Connor then hears Freya's voice almost shouting from upstairs. Okay, we'll take this beautiful map of the Everpool region. That's just perfect. Let me help you put the rest back. He realises he needs to return quickly to the main shop. He creeps back up the stairs and slips back in and starts perusing a shelf next to the curtain. The shopkeeper's back is still turned as he's putting all the other map scrolls that Freya has pulled out back into the basket. Connor steps forward. So girls, are you done with your shopping now? As they all leave the shop, the owner locks the door behind them and puts up a closed sign in the window. Where did you get to? says Freya. Connor puts a finger to his lips. Hush, I'll tell you later. They then make their way back down the winding hill and across the Merry Mile and through the large square known as the Haymarket. They spot Silver Dukes on the far side, a small shop with a gaudy sign outside depicting piles of silver coin. However, as they approach, they see a scrawled sign saying, Sorry, closed for the afternoon. Come back tomorrow. That's odd. The bookshop just closed and now this one is closed too, says Connor. Maybe it's half-day closing on Tredos in Liverpool, suggests Freya. Hmm, Yvonne didn't say anything about that, says Clarissa. They return to the Everfleet Inn. It's now late afternoon. They take their purchases up to their rooms and then return to the bar for an early dinner. So where did you get to in the Dusty Quill? asks Freya. We made that shopkeeper unschool every map in that basket to keep him busy, she laughs. Yes, he wasn't best pleased, says Clarissa. Or sneak down the stairs to check out that book club, the Quillians. They are nothing of a sort. They seem to be a group of spies or investigators, and they're going to stake out Grimes' cave tonight. I think we should be there too. I asked Yvonne, and she says the cave is reputed to be an old smuggler's spot. Oh, that sounds exciting. Will it be more pirates? says Freya. What has this to do with us? says Clarissa. Baldrick said the law here is very strict, and we don't want to get caught on the wrong side. No, I think I'll stay here and read my new books. So Connor and Freya head out as it starts to get dark. They have found Grimes Cave marked on the map, located along the cliffs a couple of miles up the coast. So we roll a weather check and we get a seven. As they leave the inn and head back to the docks, they see the weather has taken a turn for the worse. It is now overcast, with heavy clouds threatening rain. They soon find the coastal path heading out of town towards the north. They keep a lookout for anyone else on this path, so they both make a perception roll. Freya rolls an 11. Connor rolls with disadvantage due to his lack of dark vision. He gets a 4. It's a dark night, with only intermittent moonlight showing through the heavy clouds, so even Freya's perception isn't great, and Connor can see very little. What's wrong with Carissa? says Connor. Why didn't she come with us? We could do with her cat's eyes here. Oh, I don't know, replies Freya. She's struggling with all sorts of doubts, about doing the right thing, about her deity. Hmm, can't you talk her out of it? No, I think she needs another cleric or a priest of some sort to talk to. They fall silent again as they make the two mile journey along the path. There is a distant rumble of thunder. So we ask the question, do they encounter anyone along the path? We roll an eight, which is no but. So this suggests they do see something but it's not someone on the path. So maybe they see a boat out at sea. We roll an 11, so this is yes but. Maybe they see a boat landing on the beach. We roll a 16, so yes, they do. As they're around the headland, they can see the beach up ahead, and there is a boat drawing close. Oh, look, what's that? says Freya. I can see a light down there on the water. About a hundred yards ahead, they can see a narrow path threading down the cliff and onto the beach. They decide to go slowly and stealthily now, keeping close to the shadow of the bushes that line the landward edge of the path. So we make a stealth check for each of them. Connor rolls a 20 and Freya rolls 16. They reach the top of the narrow cliff path just as the boat is being pulled up onto the beach. They lurk close to the bushes as they see three dark hooded figures. 
One stays with the boat and the other two carry two small wooden crates up to the back of the beach and then disappear into the shadows. Connor and Freya descend the cliff path. Freya makes a perception check of 17. Oh, I can just make out the cave entrance back there in the shadows. We roll a perception check for the smuggler who stayed by the boat. They get a 7, so does not see the two of them lurking behind the rocks. So where are those two from the bookshop? asks Freya. Are they here to meet the shipment? Dunno, says Connor. I got the impression they were investigating or spying on the smugglers. So we ask the question, are Wilfred and Ginny around? We're all 17, so yes they are. Maybe they're in the cave already. We're all 19, so yes, they're already inside the cave. Okay, I'm going in, says Connor. But surely the smugglers will see you. I'm going to use invisibility. I'll message you to come when I've seen what's up. Okay, don't be a lone hero though. Call me if there's going to be a fight. And she gets out her hand axes in readiness. Connor casts invisibility on himself and creeps forward into the cave. It opens out into a large shadowy cavern. So we ask the question, does he see the smugglers? We get a nine, so this is no but. He can hear the faint voices of the smugglers coming from the back of the cave, but cannot see them. As he gets close, he can see there's a large metal door blocking the way through a narrow passage that leads further back. A glimmer of light from the smuggler's lamp can be seen through the narrow gaps between the rock and the door. The smugglers are clearly in a cave beyond. Just then, the light is extinguished and there's a sharp click as the metal door is unlocked and the two smugglers emerge. They have left the two crates in the room behind them. They push the metal door closed and relock it. He watches them unseen as they retreat from the cave. Then he pulls out his message wire. He sends a message to Freya. The smugglers have left the cave. Once the coast is clear out there, you can come in. At the sound of his voice, there is a small shriek behind him. He whirls round as his invisibility drops. The small redhead halfling, Ginny, is standing behind the rock, holding a dagger in her shaking hand. How did you? She stammers as she sees him appear from invisibility. At that moment, Freya then runs in. She is wielding her hand axes just in case. Connor! She gives a loud whisper as she enters the cave. Oh, there you are! At this, Connor then hears Wilfred swearing under his breath. Oh, shit! The collectors are here already? Connor puts his hands up. It's okay. We're not the collectors, and we're not here to harm you. I overheard your conversation at the bookshop this afternoon. Ginny and Wilfred emerge from behind the rocks. What? You're those customers from the shop? Now she's angry. Ned says you were a right pain, and it took ages to get rid of you. Then Wilfred speaks. We are conducting a delicate operation here. You could have ruined the old thing. Or maybe we can help you, says Connor. I reckon the information you need is behind that locked door. You got a way of getting in there? He rolls a persuasion check of ten. Well, actually, we have. Wilfred is pretty skilled with a lockpick. She lights a lantern and they both go over to the sturdy metal door. Ginny holds up the lantern and Wilfred tries to unlock the door with a small lockpick. He rolls a two. The pick breaks immediately. Sorry, Ginny. This is no standard door lock. I am never going to be able to open this. I bet Connor can, says Freya. Connor pulls out his pack of thieves' tools. Let's give it a go. But why are you helping us? You don't know anything about us. Connor shrugs. Just like a bit of adventure, I suppose. He takes out two larger lockpicks and starts to fiddle with the lock. He rolls a 25. Within a few seconds, there's a loud, satisfying click. A voila, says Connor. That was amazing, says Wilfred. How the egg did you do it? Oh, just practice. Keep at it, Wilfred. You'll learn. Connor opens the door and steps into the passage. Ginny and Wilfred start to follow. I'm going to stay and watch the cave entrance, says Frey, in case these collectors that you spoke of turn up. The passage opens up into a further room-sized cavern at the back. A wooden bench has been set up here to keep the smuggled goods off the damp cave floor. There are two small crates on the table. This is great, says Ginny. We've not managed to get this close to the merchandise before. So what is your group's interest in this anyway? Oh, well, you may as well know now you've seen this much. We're called the Quillians. We're a group of investigators and riders. We're trying to reveal the corruption in this city. The region is suffering under the rigidly strict rule of Lady Blackmore, but we've been uncovering that corruption at the heart of her government to try to discredit her. Our information suggests someone high up in the government is involved in this smuggling ring. So we roll the dice to find out more about this second faction operating in the city. We roll a five, which is a group of smugglers. And we get the keywords orb, information, item, and cell. This is a smuggling ring known as the Night Shift, who are smuggling magical items. The three of them examine the crates. They roll a nine for investigation. 
they can see nothing on the outside of the crates to indicate the contents or the ownership. Let's try to get these open, says Connor. So we ask the question, are the crates locked? We get a 19. This is yes and. This suggests more than just an ordinary lock. There is no obvious external lock on these crates. Connor and Wilfred try to pry them open. Connor feels a slight electrical tingle from the lid. What, says Connor, is that a magical lock? I reckon these are no ordinary smuggled goods. Magic, says Ginny, are you sure? I have a strong suspicion that these lids are magically sealed. Well, if that's the case, this is big, says Wilfred. That could mean there is someone smuggling in magical items. The trade of magical items is highly controlled in this region. Hmm, this is bigger than I thought, says Ginny. Meanwhile, Freya is keeping watch at the mouth of the cave. So we ask the question, do the collectors arrive while the group are in the cave? We've all a 20, so this is yes and. There's a shout from Freya as she runs into the cave. Watch out, there are two people coming down the cliff path. Connor and Wilfred quickly push the crates back into their original position and come out of the room. They push the metal door closed behind them. As they emerge, Freya calls, Quick, they're coming, we'll have to hide in the rocky cleft. So they all squeeze tightly into the rocky alcove on one side of the cave. We make a stealth check for the group to see how well hidden they are. Connor rolls a 25, Freya rolls a 7, Ginny a 6 and Wilfred a 4. There isn't enough room for them all to be properly hidden. The two collectors enter the cave. The first to enter is a rather thuggish looking young man, followed by a slender woman who appears to be elven. They have a small metal trolley with them, like those used by market traders. So we roll a perception check to see if they spot the group hiding behind the rocks. The human male rolls with disadvantage due to his lack of dark vision. He rolls a one. The elven female rolls a three. The group hiding behind the rocks stay as still and quiet as possible, hardly daring to breathe. And there we will leave our adventurers for now, hoping that the smugglers will not spot them, as well as wanting to find the evidence that points to who is behind the smuggling of magical items. Tune again next time to find out how this adventure unfolds in the city of Everpool.